they are setting setting the pace, setting the standard for for catching fish, and they're the most innovative. And this is this is why I think that lock style fishing is is the next big thing, and which is why I think that Rio just came out with these lines, and I know Echo's coming out with a Echo's coming out with a series of rods um, that's for this style of fishing um, that they developed. Uh, um, um, Tim Ray Jeff and and Pete Erickson developed these rods. And, uh, and they're going to be out really soon. That was Jeff Perrin talking about some new gear for lock style fishing, heading back to Stillwater today on the wet fly swing fly fishing show. Welcome to the wet fly swing fly fishing show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you want to go a little deeper with the podcast and take it to the river, go to wetflyswing.com slash destination to get into uh, some more info on an upcoming destination trip or to connect with local guides closer to home. In today's episode, I talk with Jeff Perrin, a stillwater guide and owner of the Fly Fisher's Place. We hear about the life cycle of coronamids and mayflies, why caddis pupa are not important, and why 12 to 20 feet should be in your game plan. Find out what technique pays the bills for Jeff, why the roll cast is important, and a little follow-up on the Denny Rickards episode. Don't miss this one as Jeff shares a great mono tip to use to find the best depth without a fish finder. So, without further ado, here's Jeff Perrin from theflyfishersplace.com. How's it going, Jeff? Good, man. How are you? Good. Good to have you on here. Uh, we're going to jump into a little bit on uh, Stillwater. We've had a few, uh, well, let's see, a couple episodes, I guess. I think, uh, let's see, I had uh, uh, way way back, way back, you got to go to Phil Rowley. I think it was episode 17. And then yeah, I had... My hero. Yeah. Oh, you, you know Phil. Yeah. <laughs> Phil, Phil and, uh, and Brian Chan, you know, his kind of, those two guys. I, I almost had Brian on. He had some, um, some things that came up health-wise, so... I'm going to hopefully get him on too because I think he's definitely knows all about the entomology as well. Um, and then Denny Rickers had him on recently, so we're gonna. You're kind of like, I think the third uh, Stillwater focused uh, guest. So are you ready to jump into a little bit here? Wow, man, I'm I'm honored to be that guy for sure. I love Stillwater, <laughs> so that's uh, that's kind of where I I take my my guiding and specialize in Stillwater. Um, oh, perfect. So it's it's pretty pretty nice to be. Uh, to be on your show talking about what I love. Cool. So you do a little bit, you kind of, I guess uh, you do a little bit of uh, Deschutes, rivers, lakes, but you definitely focus on, on the lakes. Yeah. So, um, so we, we have a, a pretty big guide service. Uh, we keep seven guides really busy and uh, throughout the season. Um, and personally I guide um, all lakes. Um, I shouldn't say entirely. I do a little bit of Spring Creek uh, guiding on the Fall River mm. and, a, and a tiny little bit on the Upper Deschutes, um, but uh, but our, our our guide staff is guiding all over Central Oregon. We're down the Lower Deschutes and over on the McKenzie and tons on the Crooked River. Um, mm. We do you know everything from day trips to camp trips and and uh, and they're all over the place. So the yeah. Deschutes is is certainly a home water for anybody that has a guide service or fly shop in central Oregon. Right. Right. And the, and the cascade lakes is kind of the, you think, you know, when I think of central Oregon, I mean, definitely those come up first and, you know, crane prairie Hosmer, is there, maybe we'll jump into a little bit on that on, on maybe we can focus a little bit down on the one just to help, um, you know, the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, you know, I, I, I primarily guide a lake called East Lake, although, oh, right. um, I do a lot of, uh, do a lot of trips to Crane Prairie and, and quite a few trips to Hosmer every season. Um, and then there's another lake that's uh, about 16 miles up the road from the, from the fly shop and sisters called Three Creeks Lake, which is a real small mountain lake at about 6,500 feet. And we do a little bit of guiding up there. Um, it's not quite as exciting as, as say going to Crane Prairie or, or East Lake where the fish are, are generally uh, a pretty big average size, um, but you catch lots of lots of nice small brook trout up at Three Creeks Lake. So oh, okay. it's a fun it's a fun place, nice little local lake. Gotcha. Okay. Well, yeah. Before we jump into all that, maybe just take us back to um, you know how you first got into fly fishing, and you know, and I and I know I had I think it was a uh, Jim Klug was on uh, in a past episode. I think you, yeah, you know from the yep. way back way back go days. So way, maybe you could talk about how, yeah how you first uh, got started, and then how you brought it all into uh, owning. A fly shop yeah well i tell you um 
I I started fishing when I was three. Um, had to wait until I was potty trained to go <laughs> on my first uh, fishing trip with my grandparents. Um, and ironically, um, that first fishing trip was at East Lake, uh, which is where I do the majority of my guiding now. Um, in fact, their their ashes are up there. Both grandma and grandpa's ashes are up there, and and um, they were the ones that left me some inheritance money to be able to buy the fly oh, shop cool. um, eventually. So I'm sure they would be very proud of the direction that I took my life. Hmm. Um, so when we, <clears throat> I was born in Portland, and when we moved over to um, to Bend in, in 1980, June of 1980, it was the summer between fifth and sixth grade for me, um, I really wanted to be a fly fisherman. In fact, when we came over um, to look for a house during spring vacation in March of 1980, I spotted my first ever fly shop, and uh, it was called the Fly Box, and it was in Bend. And, and I know that Jim talked about the Fly Box um, mm-hmm. when he was on your show a couple weeks ago. Um, and I, I asked my dad to stop, and we we went in, and the owners were Joel and Christy Weimer, and we browsed around, and I vowed I'd be back. Um, and sure enough, that the new house that we moved into was close enough for me to ride my BMX bike down there on a regular basis, and I eventually got started in fly tying classes and a rod building class, and huh. um, started working there in my junior year of high school. Um, and then uh, eventually they uh, let me become a guide, and I, I, gui- I was I was allowed to guide two places, um, and those two places were the Fall River um, and Hosmer Lake. But this is actually kind of a funny story. Um, I, I wasn't allowed to um, to drive on the guide trips, even <laughs> though I had my my driver's license. They wouldn't let me drive. They they said to the clients, "Okay, we got this this young guy. He's a good guide, but." Um, you have to drive. So, <clears throat> can I tell you about my first ever lake fishing trip? Yeah, yeah, lake and, fishing guide trip. And how? Yeah, it, uh, and before you get there, how old were you when you first started guiding for the uh, for the fly box? I, I I was either eighteen or nineteen when I started guiding there. Okay, um, and I was seventeen when I started working in the in the fly shop as a as a stock boy. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah let's hear about the let's hear about the, <clears throat> the trip. So, so go up to. Um, Go up to Hosmer Lake and, and a couple of float tubes. Um, older guy named Joe um, from from California <clears throat> and uh, his son-in-law, Scott. Scott was a brand-new fly fisherman and had never been in a float tube before. Um, had done a tiny bit of casting. Um, so, I sit, and so we launched the tubes, and we're starting to kick out. Um, and I say to Joe, hey, man, I'm going to work with Scott along this uh, reed line here. Why don't you go over to where the channel comes into the – lower lake and i'll catch up to you so we get going and um uh scott's doing pretty well and and so i say i'm gonna go check on joe and i go check on joe and and before you know it you know it's it's time to go in for lunch so we're starting to kick back to the car and we get back into the boat ramp and everybody gets out of their tubes and scott says i had a little problem out there and i said what was that and he was a tall guy. Um, I'm a short guy, about five foot six, and and uh, he's about six foot three. Um, and he turns around and kind of pulls his right ear back and shows me that he has a Royal Coachman bucktail, about a size six, just blasted <laughs> into the cartilage of his ear. Ooh. I said, "Ah, oh, man, that looks bad. It's barbless, right?" And he goes, "No, I don't think so. I forgot to pinch down the barb." Yep. So I said, "Well, let me let me take a look." And and uh, so I just I just barely touched the back of his head. hadn't even hadn't even like pulled on the fly yet. And he goes down in a heap, just <laughs> whomp, face down into the dirt into the parking lot. So now I have a guy uh, with a uh, Royal Coachman Bucktail stuck in his ear and a split open forehead. Oh. So anyway, we load up all the uh, all the float tubes into his Volvo 240 station wagon, and I remember calling my boss from the emergency room. Hey, Alan, guess where I am? <laughs> and uh, anyway, the, uh, Scott comes out of the um, emergency room uh, with a little butterfly bandage on his forehead and no hook in his ear, and I talked him into going back out to the Fall River for the rest of the day. And, uh, we had a great day and you know that, that, uh, uh, Joe, his father-in-law was a customer for 
many, many years of of, uh, of my life. I think Joe's now passed away, but uh, um, boy, he'd call me up from Santa Rosa uh, even when I uh, became the owner of the Fly Fisher's Place. And if he needed a new reel or something, he he would almost always call me. So it was just you know kind of a kind of a uh, one of those trips that wow you know turned turned out to yep. be kind of a fortuitous uh, you know moment for for really you know, gaining customers for life. Huh, exactly. That's a great, uh, yeah, that's a great story. It just shows you that, yeah, you never know, right? Even when a, a bad a bad day can turn into long-term, you never know what that could be. That's, that's exactly. Cool. Well, yeah. you know, you mentioned the Fall River, and, uh, you know, that's always the struggle on this show is that I always have these topics that I want to dig into. And, you know, today we're going to have to hold the fall for a, another episode, but, you um, you know, I want to take it back to your uh, your grandparents. You mentioned that they they kind of got you into it. Can you talk a little about your your grandparents and um, you know, and kind of what what they did, how they got you into the fishing, and and how because I mean, I guess typically you you might hear it's a, a parent or something like that. And yeah, yeah, you know, um, my my parents weren't really too into fishing. Um, my my dad certainly. Uh, tried. Um, he was busy trying to raise, you know, three kids and and uh, um, you know work and and put food on the table and and pay the mortgage. Um, so he he just mm-hmm. he just didn't have a lot of time for fishing. But my um, both grandpas and my grandma on my on my dad's side um, were uh, definitely anglers. Um, my grandparents um, on my dad's side. I uh, love to go up to East Lake in the summertime. They had a little prowler trailer and a station wagon that they put a aluminum boat on top and, mm-hmm. and, uh, they would take us kids up there, my sister Debbie and I, um, and we would troll around the lake with Ford fenders and spin and glows and, and, uh, catch kokanee and rainbows and the occasional brown or brook drought. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun. It was my, it was certainly my introduction to, to fishing, not to fly fishing, mm. but to fishing. Mm-hmm. And from, from that, you know, came the opportunity to, you know, subscribe to Field and Stream magazine, which is, I think is how I remember it, where I saw my first ever fly fisherman, you know, in, in a, in an article or an ad with, you know, a guy standing out in the river and hip waders and, you know, a flannel shirt and a, a vest. And, and <laughs> I thought, man, I want to be that guy. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know the this is this is crazy, but the first day we moved to Bend, which was in June of nineteen eighty um we were actually still unpacking boxes and and my dad's cousin, Norm Stevens, who lived in Bend, um came to the house and and I'd never met this guy in my life um and he picked me up and and took me up to the upper Deschutes around uh lava Butte area Benham Falls area, and took me fly fishing for the first time um and it was the first time I'd ever been with somebody that that was fly fishing, and I, I still remember that dude, you know, in his hip waders and his dark green Columbia Sports or a vest and Fenwick rod, and and wading out into the river with a renegade and just hammering fish. And uh, a week later, he he gave me a um, eagle claw, you know, seven and a half foot, uh, five six weight uh, um, fly rod, and and um, it had a terrible reel, and <laughs> on my next birthday, my parents bought me a, a decent reel for it, and I was out in the backyard just, just casting like crazy with it, and any chance I'd get, I, I would head down to the river and try my hand at, at fly fishing, and, and so I'm, you know, in a lot of ways, very self-taught, um, but I had some amazing mentors along the way. Well, and was that Eagle Claw, was that the uh, glass it was a glass rod. Yeah, yeah. the yellow one. Yeah, it was the yellow In one. In fact, yeah. I I rebuilt that rod. Um, had a had a guy who's one of the um, world's foremost bamboo rod refinishers. I had him refinish it for me, and I gave it to a kid um, that I knew that was getting into fly fishing. Um, that uh, was the son of a guy that owned a, a golf course over on the coast in Nesquen, um, and uh, and he's got that rod now. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. That, that's, uh, that rod we were talking about. I had, um, uh, Cameron Mortensen on in a past episode. Yeah. I listened to that. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. That was a great one. And I love that, uh, you know, just that the, he mentioned the same, basically the same rod that you're talking about there is still, he recommends that for people, you know, kids still getting into, you can still get that rod for like $30. Yep. Yep. Which is, which is a really cool tip. 
um, for people. Uh, but, um, okay. Yeah, no, this is great. I mean, I think that, um, you know, obviously you've been in it from the, the bear price. It sounds like since you could walk, you've been, you've known fly fishing was going to be your thing. Uh, you know, and maybe we, as we jump into this with, uh, and I, I guess we can maybe focus a little bit on East Lake, but maybe you can talk generally about just lakes and talk about, you know, entomology bugs, because we've had, you know, like I mentioned, Denny Rickards was on and we talked about, you know, pupa, larvae, you know, all these different things. And, you know, he broke it down pretty simply, at least the whole thing about, you know, fishing and catching in shallow water, uh, you know, and uh, we had, uh, you know, the Stillwater episode with um, Phil Roy was all coronamids. But uh, can you just yeah. take us back and just break down entomology and bugs to, you know, what we need to know to get into some fish? Yeah, well, well, for sure. I mean, I, I so first of all, I mean, I, Denny is certainly a legend in, in the sport. Um and uh um has some has some ideas uh that uh are great um and catches a you know a ton of fish um but i would have to disagree um with with his summary that that you know all the fish are caught in shallow water i mean just i was guiding last night got home about 11 last night and the last fish of the day was was caught down at about you know 17 feet Mm-hmm. Um, you know, under the surface and, and, uh, and, and, and that happens for me all the time, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I'm, I, you know, I'm definitely, uh, uh, very much, um, in interested in oh. catching fish at all depths. Okay. Uh, and, and that's and, the interesting thing about the, uh, the Denny episode, because I mean, I thought it was really cool because he did, ha- you know, have that knack for breaking it down. And he basically the simple, you know, his kind of thesis was, you know, there's this very narrow window go into the shallow water, you know, from a f- whatever a foot to three feet deep. And you get these fish as they're moving in from the deeper water into the shallow water to feed. And, and that's where you kind of, you, you, cr- you know, you get your fly in front of them and that's the whole thing. So basically, yeah. you, you know, what you're saying is you catch a lot of fish in lakes going deep. And we're talking in species wise, we're pretty much talking rainbows here today. Right. You know, rainbows and browns. Um, yeah, definitely rainbows and browns. Uh, sometimes brook trout depends on on which lake we're at, but uh, but okay. rainbows and browns species wise is definitely what we're talking about. And does this apply when we talk about depths and entomology? Would this apply to you know all around the country up to Alaska? I mean, are we are we really is this focus really for the the Northwest or Central Oregon? <laughs> Well, man, I I don't know anything about lakes in Alaska, so yeah. I, I wouldn't be able to to say that. But um, um, certainly lakes in the in the you know northern California, through the Pacific Northwest, up into British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, okay, cool, yeah, um, the Rockies, you know, yep. yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's a, we're talking, you know, we're it's talking lakes. lakes that that um, you know that are that are the right kind of lakes that you know kind of the kind of the green lakes you know lakes that are really productive um, in terms of food sources that have lots of shoals um, and of course shoals are defined as as areas where sunlight penetrates to the bottom and, and creates weed growth and of course that's gonna you know certainly bring in the bug life and bug life is going to bring in the the trout skis right yep. so that's that's the that's okay. the exciting thing and you know i mean and in my opinion um you you know you could see fish out in in 20 feet of water fish um and be fishing you know on the surface um you could be fishing you know four feet down you could be fishing 19 feet down okay yeah, yeah. So there's a wide range. Well, let's just jump into it. Yeah, maybe you can break down. Um, I don't know. Do you want to start with a little bit of the entomology, the bugs, the life cycle stuff, and then talk about how you, you know, you get into fish or how would you like yeah. to? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, I, I shared with you um, mm-hmm. that, that PowerPoint presentation that I do for fly clubs. Um, is that PowerPoint and- anywhere? Is that uh, online or anywhere that people could take a look at that? Um, is that kind of no, more, yeah, okay, no, 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 That's kind of your private, I mean, yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah, kind of, uh, um, something that I give to fly clubs, so I don't want to, oh, you sure. know, just share it, yeah, yeah, with, with the, with the world, but, um, but yeah, um, you know, so I, I, I have in there towards the end, you know, dive pretty deep into, into entomology and, um, because I think it's so, so important, and, you know, I talk about the top three, um, and you know, which of course is going to be regionally important. I mean, I'm talking about top three for, for the five lakes that I'm talking about in the presentation, um, are East Lake, um, Crane Prairie, Lava Lake, Wickiup, and Crane Prairie. Um, and you know, I find that, that, that the top three food sources for, for trout in those lakes, 
um, typically would be, you know, chronomids, calabatus, uh, leeches, and then um, I go to the next three, and uh, and the fourth one is terrestrials, and arguably at some times of the year, um, particularly up at East Lake, uh, terrestrials could be maybe even put into that number two slot. Mm. Um, so it, it just depends on, on what time of year you're at uh, and, and which lake you're fishing on. Okay. So, you know, like, like let's just take, for instance, the chronomid life cycle. Um, you know, you're going to find those, those chronomid uh, larvae, you know, they're typically going to be, you know, red with the hemoglobin in them uh, to olive to sometimes kind of a, a lightish tan, um, and they're going to be living down in the mud, but they, you know, they have a very cool, um, attribute and that they're, they're not just always, you know, down in their little mud burrows. Um, they actually come out of the mud and, and sort of, you know, suspend above the, the bottom of the lake, um, six inches or a foot or so. Um, and I'm not exactly sure why they do that. I would assume, you know, for growth or, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, something and, and, and they become very, very, uh, available to the fish. So, you know, at those times, uh, a lot of times when I'm fishing in the summertime, I'll, I'll hang a, um, an all red, uh, uh, chronomed, you know, red bead or, or even no bead at all. Just, just a red body, um, right on the bottom to, to mimic that, um, that food source um and then come up from from that fly a few feet and, and run a pupa with a you know a little white bead and and then maybe one more fly a little bit uh, a little bit shallower underneath the indicator um and of course uh, uh the pupil um process occurs and and at i mean lately up at east lake we've been having these enormous um uh, uh, chronomid emergences and and you'll just see you know millions of uh, chronomid shucks at the surface in the morning um, and I'm not sure uh, when when this when this big hatch is happening it must be in the wee hours of the morning or late at night when I'm not there because the shucks are always there uh, when I get there and and you know the the fish are obviously well fed um, when that's happening but those pupa you know um, come from from that larva they, they have a pupil stage that um, and, can, the larva, and, and can you break yeah. that out a little bit just on the chronomids because um well and that's you know when i was with uh denny he talked a lot about the the pupa the pupae and the and, and the um you know the larva and the different can you just talk about the general uh life cycle of chronomids versus the, yeah, the, yeah. the mayflies and other oh yeah for sure yeah i mean um you know uh, chronomids have a have a complete life cycle so they they have a larval stage they have a pupil stage, um, and then they have an adult stage. And the adult stage, obviously, is the egg laying stage, and and uh, and that happens all over again. And you know that that uh, that process um, uh, can can be very very quick. You can have multiple broods in a year, um, where you know the the egg from from a adult um, chronomid uh, can can actually hatch. Um, you know, just a few weeks after that egg was was uh was laid and and so you can get multiple broods a year of chronomids that's why they're so prolific and so important as trout foods um but of course mayflies you know calabatus is is the primary um fly that you're going to find mayfly that you're going to find on on still waters there there are some others um uh cenus and centroptilum and and other other mayflies that you might find uh, regionally important on some lakes, but but calabatus are king, man. I mean, that's mm. just that's just what you're really going to find. And of course, mayflies have an incomplete uh, life cycle. They don't have a pupil stage, um, you know. And so I think maybe in some cases there could be some confusion um, when when people start talking about emergers. You know, the emergence process of a mayfly is is kind of a um, a mysterious thing because you've got You've got a nymph that that is, you know, coming off the bottom and and making its way towards the surface of the lake to to emerge, but it's, but it hasn't pupated. It didn't it didn't go through any sort of metamorphosis to get there. That that mm. process of emergence is going to happen at the surface of the lake, um, and and you know it's it's so cool, Dave, to see how many different emerger patterns there are because because the emergence process. Um, can be viewed by the trout 
uh, in so many different ways, right? You've got your flies like the Quigley Cripple, and you've got your flies like the Sparkle Done, and you've got your flies like the Almost Done, which are which are to- three totally different shapes of flies. Um, and you know, at times, some some days the fish will will just hammer um, one over another. And it's it's all because you're matching how those flies are emerging on any particular day, right? So so lately I've been doing really well on a fly called an almost done, which has got a zealon tail and and a real thin biot body, um, and a and a very short nubbed you know parachute post um, with a grizzly hackle around it. And it's tied on a scud hook, so it so that the natural curvature of that hook really throws that back of the body and the and the zealon tail down below the surface film, below the meniscus. Mm-hmm. But the the hackle and the and the wing um, you know, are supported right at the surface. And that that fly looks like the nymph has has gotten to the surface and is is pushing its way through through that that rubbery layer at the surface film called the meniscus. Um, and you know it's very vulnerable because you know half of the half of the nymph is is still underneath the water and and the adult is trying to crawl out but the wings haven't sprouted yet. It's a, hmm. it's just a pattern that the fish just rise to with so much confidence because they know it can't get away. If it, it was if it was the real thing, it's not flying off on them. You know, um, it's stuck there. And and of course I think you know I think that the Craig Matthews Sparkle Den um, is one of the most brilliant flies. I, I'm a huge fan of comparadens and, and Sparkle Dens in general, but this, you know, to take that comparadens pattern, the old Kasi Natasi comparadens pattern, and to add that Zelon tail like like Craig Matthews did from Blue Ribbon Flies years ago, um, it just looks like that that mayfly is still stuck. It can't get away yet because it's still attached to the nymphal shuck. And you know, there are times that 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 fly will outfish pretty much anything on the water lake or river okay okay cool so so yeah so basically that's the big difference between and when you look at lakes um and i just want to note too i had uh, rick hayfley on episode 37 where he talked more about the river you know he's an entomologist out here and yeah there's that, that guy yeah and rick's, rick's a good guy and then uh and phil roley was episode 34 uh danny rickards was episode 64 just, just for reference. So, so yeah. So basically, the chironomids mayflies. You, you've got the chironomids that have a have the larval and the pupal stage, as well as the adults. And then the mayflies just have kind of the nymph and adult. They don't really have that uh, that pupa stage. So that's the biggest difference. Now, um, I mean, are there any other details to know about the life cycle besides just knowing, you know, that? And that was the thing with Denny that he noted that the pupa was really the key because I think he said that eighty percent of the time you know, fish are feeding on that stage. Is that the case for, for, um, for you as well, that, that, that the pupa is really the focus? Well, the pupa of what, I mean, what, what are we, what are we talking about? Are we talking about pupa of, of, uh, of midges or chronomids? Or are we talking about pupa of caddis? Cause those are the only things that you're going to have uh, a pupal stage, um, of, in, in lakes. And I are mean, there a lot of caddis in lakes? Well, <clears throat> It depends on the lake. I mean, I, I I would say not really on on my on my lakes. I mean, we see a lot of little black caddis, um, and you know, I would I would call them very very unimportant. Um, you know, the the yeah, I yeah. I, so I see not, quite a few, but yeah, but don't, yeah, don't don't really find them in in no. throat pump samples, and don't really see fish actively feeding on caddis too much. Um, on most of the lakes that I fish, gotcha. um, but, and that but of course, it. yeah, that definitely does. Yeah. So, so you don't have to worry about caddis, you know, so to speak. So basically we're kind of looking at for the most part, we can talk about leeches in a bit, but really, you know, for the bugs, you know, the focus here is chronomids, mayflies. And then, so again, you know, and, and getting back to that life cycle. And, so yeah. And damsels. And yeah, da- damsels. Right. Right. Yeah. So you do yeah. have the, of course, damsels and that, uh, and then the, in the terrestrials and, and, but um, but I guess if we're still focused on chronomids mayflies, which you know we talked about chronomids with uh, Phil Roy, he goes deep in his balanced leech um, and a lot of the details there. Um, but again, for the life cycle, so are there any other details that we should know that would help um, you know somebody out there that was kind of hitting the lake and wanted to try to you know match the hatch? Well, I mean, let's just let's just specifically take uh, uh, chronomids, I guess, and and say you know if you're trying to match the hatch. Um, you should have, um, you know, an all red, 
um, you know, blood worm type pattern to, to definitely fish on the bottom. It, look, it's not going to work every time, but it's definitely worth a worth a shot to put it down there in you know 12 to 20 feet of water and and hang it underneath an indicator mm-hmm. so that it's you know six to 12 inches off of the bottom. Um, that can be very effective. Um, and then in, in terms of you know kind of having um, yeah a, a good selection of flies to to you know build around that you know from so going from bottom to top. Um, you know, it, you absolutely want to have not, not only all white beaded flies, but, you, um, in some cases, um, I think it's really, really important to have some flies that have, you know, darker beads, like a gunmetal bead, um, um, can, uh, as particularly when the lakes get really clear, what I find is, is sometimes those all white beads will be kind of a turnoff to the fish. Um, you want something a little bit more subtle. So mm-hmm. like a little tiny piece of poly yarn tied off of the, the eye of the hook, um, and then put like a little gunmetal bead and then whatever color of, you know, body wrap that you're going to do with it, with whatever ribbing, you know, typically black with silver or black with copper, um, red with red with silver, red with copper, um, brown with copper. Um, sometimes I do black with a blue rib, um, black with a red rib. Obviously, is is really really good. And if you carried those, I mean, for for me where I, where I'm fishing, I carry them in, in pretty much from size, um, you know, twelve down to size eighteen with some with a few really small olive ones to to match some locally important hatches. But, you know, you, you got to kind of know what your, what your local hatches are. And, and mm. if you just had, had that kind of selection, you know, from, yeah. from maybe size 12 to 20 and, and some different colors, um, different bead colors, don't always rely on that kind of ice cream cone type of a pattern right. because it, 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 huh. it, it can sometimes be a real turnoff to fish in very clear waters. Gotcha. Yeah. How could you find, well, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, how you can find, uh, you know, for somebody local hatches, but before we get to that, I want to jump right back. Um, you know, again, I'm just trying to simplify the, this entomology because I think, you know, when people first hear entomology, that's the first thing right away there. If they're not into it, you know, it gets, it seems like a lot. So, you know, adults, right? So for chronomids, are we really, can we scratch those off too? Because we're really not focused too much on adults, like any of the surface or, or are we? It's, it's pretty, I mean, I would say for the lakes that I fish, it's pretty rare, you know, um, you're not going to see fish actively feeding on the surface to adult chronomids as often as you would see them maybe feeding actively on the surface for calabatus or damselflies or, um, terrestrials. I mean, it, it happens and, and, you know, like there's some really good patterns, including, you know, century drive midge or Griffiths gnat, um, or, um, gosh, uh, rally has a pattern. I can't remember what it's called. It has a little grizzly hackle tip tail okay. and a deer hair, um, over the top of the body and then a grizzly hackle. It's, it's a, it's a killer little pattern. Um, and when, when it's happening, that that's a pattern that I use a lot, but I can't remember the name of it. Okay. But, well, um, yeah. yeah but anyway, yeah. that, yeah, it happens. But I would say that, you know, if, if you're really looking for the best fishing um in lakes you're you're going to primarily focus on chronomid pupa um yeah. you know and and of course those colors of you know red brown black um with different ribbing colors and occasionally chromie man i mean that that's oh, yeah. a hell of a fly you know that that yeah. that all silver bodied and in fact the last fish of the night last night um on my guide trip was was caught on a chromie so that's, um, gotcha. yeah, it can be a really good okay. fly. And in the, um, and so in the larva is just, I mean, that's essentially the nymph. I mean, that's a, a, another, uh, part of the life cycle. You're not really targeting cause they're kind of in the mud and, and no, 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 that's no, no, you definitely, definitely are, um, are targeting them. Like I said, they'll, they'll come out of the mud. That's one of the cool attributes of it. I mean, oh, that when is, they're down the, in, that is, yeah. the, that is the nymph that's coming out and popping it up. It is. And, oh, okay. Yeah. Before, before the pupation gotcha. happens, um, they'll, they'll just come out and, and yep. sort of wriggle around and sort of suspend there above the bottom of the lake. So the larva is very important. Okay. All right. Perfect. Perfect. So at times, at times, okay. <laughs> Not so, every day. Yeah. Okay. So that's, and then if we go to the mayflies again, you know, you have the nymph and basically the adult and there's, I guess the, the sub imago imago, which is a, a, another part of the life history, but um, yeah, man. Yeah. You, you, you know, I, I, I kind of love, constantly learning about fly fishing um and uh and entomology and and you know definitely 
consider myself a student of, of the sport of fly fishing. And uh, one of the things that absolutely blew my mind this year. Hey, no, dogs are barking. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> bird just hit bird just hit the window. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> sorry. That's right. Um, so anyway, one of the things that blew my mind this year um, about uh, – about may, uh, the Calabatus mayflies is, I don't know whether you knew this or not, but but in the uh, in the spinner stage, the imago stage. So after um, the adults have uh, um, uh, ha- have mated, um, and they uh, uh, normally most mayflies go right down to the water and, and lay their eggs, and the eggs mm-hmm. sink you know down to the bottom of the river um and it takes several days for those eggs to incubate into um uh tiny little nymphs well with calabatus females they actually um will go back to the streamside or lakeside vegetation um and let those eggs incubate on their body for about 5 days so that when they when they do finally do their uh spinner fall at the surface of the water as soon as the eggs are laid into the lake, they hatch into uh, um, small nymphs. Like mm-hmm. almost instantaneously, oh, wow. the eggs hatch into small nymphs. Crazy. It's the only mayfly that's known to do that. So huh. just this, just this kind of great, you know, well, crazy evolution of of Calabatus has has created this this way for you know those eggs to to incubate on the body of the female. And and then at the egg laying stage, um, when the spinner comes back to to the water in the in the spinner fall, um, those eggs just instantly hatch into into small nymphs. And of course, that's why you get such a quick you know brood turnaround. Like the 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 calabatus that hatch in you know May and June, um, the, those eggs that are laid uh, take about six weeks to mature um, for the second brood to hatch a little bit later in the season. So like right now um, up at East Lake, the calabatus that we fished yesterday um, were, were the second brood and those, those nymphs were just, just, you know, laid um, um, by females back, uh, back in like June and, and late May. Okay. Is there Pretty a, rad. is there that, no, that is really cool. I love that stuff too. Uh, is it for the calabas? Is there a common name for the, or is that, or is that the common? Um, you know, I mean, there, there, there is a common name, uh, although I would say that Calabatus is probably more common than anything. Uh, you know, Calabatus is the, is the Latin term and there, and there are, you know, several different species of Calabatus that, that hatch, uh, um, regionally. Um, but, but, um, if you, you know, if you looked around, um, you would also find them called speckled wing quills oh yeah um right. yeah so yeah. but but most people most people just you know they call them i mean that's yeah. yeah that's that's like a long that's like longer than calling them calabatus and calabatus is easy to pronounce and unlike ephemerella which is a pale morning done most people would butcher that so gotcha. um, no. you know that yeah they just go with, they just go with the latin term yeah that's you awesome know, even the people that hate to hate to talk about you know bugs in Latin terms still call them calabatus. No, that, that's that's what's funny. I'm laughing because a friend of mine, Greg, he, we we've joked about that for years. That he, he says calabatus in a really funny way because he kind of is kind of making fun of the, the you know the nerdy entomologist folks, you know, like yourself and kind of like me too. You know, it's I, I love that stuff. So um, okay, well, let me just uh, break this down really quick again. So we got um, we got uh, acronymids. So I you know. That's uh, we've talked a little bit about that. We got the mayflies. We've talked a little bit about that, and there is the adult stage. But would you say eighty percent of the time it's more of a um, uh, a nymph game as well under the surface for the calabatus? Uh, hmm. Well, or just for mayflies in general on lakes? Yeah, yeah, I would say definitely. Um, um, you know, most times it, it could could be eighty percent, might be might be less. Um, I mean, I I got to tell you, I mean, I spend as much time as possible fishing dry flies. Um, you know, I, I'll just give you an example. I, last week I had a, a really good customer in the boat and, and, um, and we focused on, on dry flies, just kind of work the margins of the lake. And there were enough, you know, kind of calibata spinners in the morning when we first got there. And then we moved on to ants and beetles, um, in a rocky area of the, of the margins of the lake. And, and then I knew that the hatch was going to start around uh, one o'clock. And so we went back to, um, to fish in the calibatus hatch. And, um, you know, we, we, we caught like 90% of our fish on, on, on dry flies. So, okay. uh, it, it, you know, it depends on depends. the season, but, but, uh, 
you know, in the in the weather, man, the weather can play a huge, huge role in whether or not, you know, the fish are going to rise or not rise. Mm-hmm. So, um, but yeah, you got to be ready for anything. Um, but I, yeah. you know, I, I guess with, with my own fishing, um, um, and guiding, you know, and I feel like when I'm guiding them, I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, using the customers in my boat, the friends in my boat as a, as a tool to deliver the fly. I feel like I'm, I'm kind of fishing when I'm out there doing that. Um, that, that, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pick dry flies, um, as often as I can, cause it's really fun to, to watch the fish rise and, they're quite willing to do it in on a lot of days. Gotcha. Okay. No, that's, that, that's, uh, helps to clarify things. And, and we're going to jump into, um, you know, maybe leeches, terrestrials a little more. Um, and you've talked a little bit about, you know, just fishing, maybe you can just take us to East Lake. Um, and with that as a focus and talk about how you get, you know, your clients into fish there uh, on a typical day, uh, maybe just break down, you know, what you're using, kind of the, the gear, the leader, and just, uh, you know, simplify it for us if you can. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so first of all, um, I'm a total boat freak. Um, I've, I, in my career as a guide, I've, I kind of keep, you know, buying boats and <laughs> upgrading boats. And, nice. and so currently I'm, I'm using, um, a boat called a Hughescraft 18 foot open fisherman. It's got a, um, 60 horse, um, Honda on it. And then on the front, it's got an 80 pound thrust Minn Kota electric, um, which is really great for like buzzing around the margins of the lake and just, you know, getting in quiet to the fish and, and stay in a certain distance off of the shoreline. And, and, uh, it can take a lot of work on a windy day to, to keep that boat, you know, going straight into the wind and, and getting people within a, a perfect casting distance of the bank line. But this boat, this boat is like an open dance floor in the, in the middle of it. It's just got gotcha. nothing, nothing other than <laughs> the Yeti cooler and, and uh and stuff in the middle so people have a lot of room to to fish and move around and it's that, fantastic that, that yeah. is one of my questions one of my rapid fire questions sometimes is that uh, you know if you had to pick between and i guess for this you'd think lakes you think you know that boat versus a drift boat versus maybe some kind of a pontoon or a single what, what, what if you had to pick one you know for yourself maybe if you weren't guiding what, what would you go with oh man i mean i i, I would i would buy this boat over and over and over again. I mean, yeah. out of all the boats that I've had, um, this one is the best so far. And even if even if you're on your own, just out there fishing by yourself, that's still the, the boat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the the other The other boat that I have, um, uh, well, I've, I've got two other boats. One one boat I bought for the staff to use. Um, it's a boat that's kind of similar to this. It's a it's a, a slightly smaller smoker craft, and and it's a big open you know type lake boat as well. And then and then personally, I also use a, a Koffler uh, Rocky Mountain trout boat, and that I'll use on oh, yeah. smaller lakes like Hosmer, and mm-hmm. and uh, I'll use it at, at certain times you know in the fall when they'll take up the the docks. It's very difficult to to um to launch um or get the boat back on the trailer this big boat of mine so um i've got the rocky mountain trout boat i've got a a Minn Kota motor and a and a yamaha eight horse gas motor for it and i can you know go up and easily launch that from from any any launch i mean i can put that boat in any place oh, cool. um so it's a it's a heck of a it's a heck of a lake boat too um but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I try to, I mean, to answer your question, um, got off on boats, but to answer your <laughs> question, I try, I try to do, I try to do four or five different things, um, with my clients in a day so that, you know, so that we're not stuck with, with just, you know, like a one, I don't want to be a one trick pony guide. Um, I want to, I want to introduce them to several different techniques so that they're not only learning, um, but, but keeping their mind active, you know, it can be really boring just sitting there and, and either wind drifting or mm-hmm. fishing a bobber double anchored up, um, all day or, or even staying in the same spot and, and fishing dry flies all day. Um, so my typical day usually starts with, um, launching the boat and, uh, and immediately looking for rising fish. Um, you know, obviously you're going to find a lot of rising fish, um, really close to the shoreline and, and Hey, that's where we launched the boat. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so usually, uh, on most days we're going to get some calabatus spinners in the morning when we're launching the boat. Um, and then, um, 
that that oftentimes ends. Um, and usually up at East Lake, the wind is, is coming out of the west uh, in the afternoon. Um, and if it's coming out of the west, that really, really puts us in good position for wind drifting over the um, east side uh, shoal, which is which is enormous. There's just this great shoal that goes out several hundred yards from the from the shoreline um and i'll i'll go out depending on the time of year i'll go out anywhere from from 20 feet deep to about 40 feet deep turn the boat um sideways into the wind and and throw out a a drift sock um some people call them drogues depends on where you're from um sea anchor is another term for it but it's basically just this this great big um kind of um windsock looking yeah. type thing you know and and uh, it it keeps the boat drifting slowly and also keeps it you know um um kind of uh um uh square to the wind mm. so that so that the the wind is pushing on the side of the boat <laughs> but the the weight of this drogue is is slowing down that drift i mean without it you'd probably be drifting twice as fast and and quite possibly really the flies would be moving way way too fast for the for the fish to want to eat it so um and there's there's two ways to approach that um there's there's kind of the just the typical wind drift um which is in, in fairness, uh, pretty similar to trolling, um, you know, where you're mm-hmm. casting kind of upwind and and uh, and just letting the wind do the do the trick. Um, uh, as the wind is pushing the boat, um, you're you're basically trolling those flies behind you. Um, almost always, this is done with a sinking line, anything from a hover to an intermediate. Um, down to a type three, um, and then and then the other method is uh, lock style, uh, which I think is is really going to start catching on um, as a as a more important technique with with um, uh, anglers uh, in the in the U.S. Um, it, it's it's done more over in in like um, you know the U.K. And down in Tasmania, um, which is where I learned the technique, um, but it's but it's using that drogue um, to push the boat, but actually fishing downwind with different densities of sinking lines, and then and then as the boat is kind of pushing, um, you know, with wind, you're kind of keeping the the retrieve to just get the retrieve slightly faster than the pushing into the into the flies. So what is the difference between the lock style and just the wind drifting? So the lock style is done is done downwind, and the and the typical wind drifting uh, is done upwind. So the the uh, wind drifting that's done upwind is very similar to trolling, um, and then the lock style is is something that um, is done over in the UK, um, done down in in, uh, in Tasmania, which is where I. I first learned it um, fishing the lakes with with some really good anglers down there, um, and so in in competition, so the competition anglers aren't allowed to use um, um, you know suspension devices, so they couldn't oh, yeah. they couldn't chronomid fish with an indicator, and they're not allowed to to, to troll the fly, um, and so technically you know wind drifting when you're fishing upwind is trolling, um, so so they've developed these techniques. And and now even special lines to um, effectively fish downwind of the boat, and, you, and so you're just really, you know, kind of keeping up with the drift. Oh, okay. um, yeah. uh, so as as you let's just say you make a 50 foot cast downwind of the boat, yeah, and the and the wind is blowing and the boat's moving, you know, just under a half a mile an hour. Um, you're going to be retrieving that fly just basically enough to keep the line tight. Sure. Maybe maybe a little bit faster than that. It just depends. But um, kind of like a nymph, just, like you're nymphing on a river sort of thing. Just yeah, out of a boat yeah. in a river, that same sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And so these new reel lines that they've just developed, um, specifically for lock sail fishing, are, are called the sweep series. They've got a sweep intermediate and a and a sweep fast. Um, and, and so basically, um, they, they, ha- they get a big belly in the line underneath the fly. Um, and that helps keep the, the tension of, of the retrieve tighter. Um, and so they're really great for this, this new lock style. Uh, I mean, it's not new, yeah. um, around the world, but it's certainly yeah, new to here. us. Yep. Yep. And, and I, I'll tell you, man. I think that um, that this is really going to catch on big time. And yeah. one of the reasons that I think this is 
about 14 years ago, um, I was introduced to, to Euronymphine, Czech Nymphine, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and we were one of the first shops in Oregon to to really you know follow it and, and actually sell the gear and and mm. we were we were super super nerdy with Czech Nymphine and and I think that with the popularity of that and people sort of actually finally paying attention right, to took, these took 14 inc- years <laughs> inc- <laughs> yep it did well it took 13 anyway yeah. um it, uh, the people that are paying attention to the competition anglers um and and figuring out that these guys are the best in the world and the, and they're catching the, the absolute living crap out of the fish yeah. um in both lakes and rivers and with techniques that are just pretty darn foreign to to most of us um this is something that these guys are doing and and I think that now um the, these fellows finally and 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 ladies too there's a lot of great uh competition anglers of of both sexes and I'll tell you man they are setting setting the pace, setting the standard for for catching fish, and they're the most innovative. And this is this is why I think that lock style fishing is is the next big thing, and which is why I think that Rio just came out with these lines, and I know Echo's oh, coming yeah. out with a Echo's go. coming out with a series of rods um, that's for this style of fishing um, that they developed. Uh, um, um, Tim Ray Jeff and and Pete yep. Erickson developed these rods. And, uh, and they're going to be out really soon. And, uh, it's, it's just, it's just the next thing, man. Hmm. It's the so, really exciting stuff. Uh, no, that's great. I think uh, I totally agree. Yeah. The Euro thing is kind of going, going off now. Um, so back to, you know, you talked about rising fish. Um, you talked about, I guess, wind drifting and lock style are kind of a, a similar sort of, um, if you had to characterize yeah. these types of fishing, what would be the other types just to kind of summarize that on the lakes? Well, so, so that, yeah, so the other things that I like to do, um, are the, you know, usually go from the dry fly to the wind drift. Um, and then, um, around lunchtime, um, uh, a lot of times I'll go out, you know, depending on, on what time of the year it is, if it's in the spring, it's, it's anchoring up in shallower water, like 10 feet or, or so. And, and this time of year I'm anchoring up out in about 18 feet, um, and, and fishing chronomids underneath an indicator. Okay. Um, and then, uh, as the afternoon wind, um, increases and usually the temperature increases, um, I personally then start working terrestrials along the bank line and, or, um, kind of waiting for that afternoon calabatus hatch to happen. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So basically, yeah, it's a, uh, so you get the dries and you get the different, um, uh, different orders of bugs and you, I mean, you, you definitely mix it up, which is a, a cool way to do it. If you had to look at, you know, pick uh, one of those methods to talk about here and maybe with a focus on East Lake, you know, is there one that you do, um, more of the time or maybe you have more success or one you want to just focus on here? Um, yeah, well, I'll tell you that, you know, I, I, I oftentimes joke, um, that, that I pay my rent with the, with the chronomid underneath an mm-hmm. indicator. Um, but the last couple of weeks, um, I'm not sure whether it's the timing of, of the chronomid emergence. Like I was mentioning earlier, um, I'm getting there in the morning and seeing just millions and millions of in, empty, uh, um, mm-hmm. you know, pupil shucks at the surface. Um, and during the afternoon, we're just not getting any bobber down uh, action at all for, for the last, you know, like week and a half or so. Um, last night was nice. Uh, I did a kind of a rare evening fish till dark trip with some clients and, and, uh, and we got some bobber down action, which was cool. Um, but, uh, but, you know, like I was mentioning, um, the, the last week and a half or two, um, that's been, that's been slow. So I haven't been really paying the rent with that one, man. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but, but definitely working, you know, working quite well with the dry fly, just sort of knowing where to look and, and being patient and, um, you know, just trusting that, that they are going to come up and, and eat a beetle. Or if yeah. you're, you know, if there's just a few calabatus around they're they're looking up for them. Gotcha. Well, where would somebody go? If you just said, generally speaking, you know, I think you mentioned this earlier, um, you know, know your hatches. Is there any resource, you know, online or books, you know, mag- anything you think of that could help somebody that maybe they don't know their hatches on their lake that they can, they can learn or where you, maybe there's a, is there an entomology book or something you'd recommend? You know, there, there is, um, um, a really cool video if, if you're just learning about bugs, um, mm-hmm. called, uh, bugs of the underworld. Oh, cool. Um, it's, uh, it, 
uh, really shows the life cycle of, of all the, all the different things. The guy was just a genius at cinematography, um, got underneath the water with the camera and, and really showed some, some cool stuff. Um, so that would be one that I would definitely recommend. Um, I, I think that there's a, a great, uh, entomology book by Jim Schulmeyer, um, Hatches for Lakes, I think it's okay. called. Um, little little hardbound book that I'm not. I don't know whether it's still in print, but I'm sure mm-hmm. you can find them. Um, and uh, that that just covers you know all the different things that you're going to find on lakes that the fish eat, including you know scuds and leeches and snails and weird stuff that you know isn't always necessarily thought of. I mean, mm-hmm. leeches are obviously, but um, but you know snails and and scuds and water boatmen sometimes are totally off people's radar. Um, and, uh, yeah, I would say, I would say, you know, kind of learn from that. Anything that, uh, that Phil Rowley and Brian Chan do, they've got a, yeah. a, a terrific series right. of videos. Of um, and, uh, man, yeah, that, that, uh, yeah. that app that they have. Yeah. Um, have you used that? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Is it I'm, pretty, I'm uh, does it go it's, into entomology and some of that? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, they've, they've got different categories in, in the app and, um, yeah, you can, you can really, it's 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 just fun to it's just fun to 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 look at. I mean, even for me, you know, as a as another you know guide, I'm I'm certainly not um, Phil Rowley, but but I take this pretty seriously. Yeah. And and uh, um, even for me, it's really really fun to go and and watch those videos and learn from them and and stuff. It's it's That's yeah, cool. those guys are those guys are the best. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay, so. So yeah, I think that kind of takes us, uh, you know, somewhat full circle. We might not dig into all the leeches. I mean, typically, you know, leeches, terrestrials. I mean, that that's kind of when I think of lake fishing. You know, you think yeah. of the woolly bugger, and I mean, that's the first thing I kind of think of. And well, uh, I think I think yeah. nowadays, you know, the the leech thing, the leech game has certainly turned into a, a lot more of a balanced um, yeah, why, you know, under underneath an indicator yeah. um, for the most part because you can. You can fish that leech at a at a consistent depth through the entire retrieve, as opposed to you know yep. fishing it on a on a sinking line where the where the leech is you know eventually going to sweep up towards the towards mm-hmm. the boat towards the rod tip and and uh, so just being able to get kind of a, a longer you know retrieve at at an exact depth is a huge advantage and you know like I've been tying a lot of leeches um, balanced but but also um, I think there's a there's a really cool uh, thing happening with flies, kind of a modernization of hooks and beads and and just fly patterns in general. And I'm tying a lot of flies, a lot of leech patterns on jig hooks mm-hmm. um, with tungsten beads on the front and and kind of Euro style, you know, type type uh, hooks and beads. Um, but tying just these these killer little, you know, size 14 and 16 or even 10s and 12s, you know. Um, mini leeches and, and fishing them underneath indicators with a very slow retrieve and, and hammering, you yeah. know, uh, some nice fish with those things. And yep. that, so yeah, that's, that's, I think the, the modernization of, of, uh, of fly patterns is huge right now. It's such a fun part of this. No, it is. I, I agree. Yeah. It seems like both rivers and lakes and now we're hearing, yeah, it's uh, the, the new style Euro nymphing or, you know, whatever you, you know, and the, and of course the jig hooks is, is gaining popular as well. So, okay, well this gives us, and I'll put some links to the show notes to uh, the, the, some of the resources we talk about here, people can check out, um, you know, is there anything else? Well, before we kind of move on here, anything else um, you want to touch on just as far as entomology bugs, uh, you know, we've kind of hit on the surface. I know there's a ton more we can go deeper, but just for generally, if you had to focus it or, or we kind of, did we cover most of the big topics? No, I, I think, I think we covered, I think we covered the, the majority of it. If it, if it creates questions for people, they're certainly more than welcome to, to give me a call or shoot me an email and, and, uh, and talk more about it. You know, if they, if they need to, that would be great. Um, so yeah, okay. we, right, yeah, I think we, co- I think we covered cool. the best of it. Yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll put a link to your site and so they can get a hold of you on. And is there a good, um, on social, is there a good, uh, or website or email? What, what's the best way if somebody had a, a question or they wanted to connect with you? Well, they can go to they can go to the flyfishersplace.com um and uh that's all run together as as one word no apostrophe on the s um and they can go to to flyfishersplace.com and then and then just do a form submission um to email me. I get all those emails um uh, sent to me or or if they want to they can email me direct which is greendraycatch 
at uh, gmail.com. Okay, so green cool. green drake like the like the mayfly hatch and then hatch like they do in the in the spring and at gmail. Okay, so, yeah, um, it's be- easy. Before I let you go here, do you have a few more minutes for a quick little rapid fire round? Totally. All right. All right. Good. Um, and one of these questions, I'm not sure if you know the whole story, but this popped up. I remember a while ago, I saw it out there, the story, and I, I didn't know this person, but um, who was Steelhead Joe? This is on a different topic, but do you know, know this um, that story that came out? I guess the guy passed away and there was a little bit of a... Yeah. Is yeah. there, is there yeah. a, su- a quick little summary of, of who that was and his connection to the, the Deschutes or that, or that area? Yeah, kind of, kind of a very sad story. Um, Steelhead Joe at, at one time was was one of my best friends, um, and uh, we spent a lot of a lot of time together. Um, uh, he he and I really really kind of fit well together at a certain time in in my life um, um, after a divorce from my first wife and 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 before meeting meeting my second wife. Um, he and I did a lot of fishing together and. And he was uh, uh, an incredible uh, steelhead angler um, that guided for the fly fishers place that guided oh, for, okay. for my business. Oh wow! And um, anyway, um, to kind of summarize it, um, you know, without getting into into too much detail, if if somebody really wanted some some extraordinary detail, um, uh, there was a, a, a an article written in Outside Magazine that tends to pop up on social media from time to time and you could find it by uh, googling it um it's some okay. something about the life of steelhead that's joe, right but, and that's um, where i saw yeah. it I'll, I'll put a link to that article in the show notes yeah but anyway joe joe ended up taking his own life and and um um had some some mental health issues that uh um he he didn't want to address and a bunch of us uh friends friends of his from sisters really really tried to to be with him through that through that process and and um i actually found him uh the first time that he that he attempted that and uh it was it was rough um and uh it's a it's a sad it's a sad story and and it's a it's a sad part of my life and um you know i i miss him i miss him um Mm -hmm. but he uh yeah he he had some demons, man. And yep. uh, if if people are interested, they should they should read the article because it's it's yep. uh, it's pretty incredible, really. Okay. I mean, it's yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Pre- it's it's sad, but yeah. it's it's a it's a hell of a story. Have okay. you read it? Did you read it? Uh, I, yeah, well, not the whole. thing. <laughs> I was actually just uh, scrolling. I didn't know. That's what I was going to ask you to see if there was actually more of a a story behind it. I saw that yeah. that outside. Yeah, I didn't know if that was kind of just a, a kind of a highlighter sort of thing, but that is kind of the the full. You can kind of read that and get the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, what did? Um, yeah, no. I mean, I'll definitely, um, like I said, put a link to that. And and as soon as I get off here, I'm gonna re- I'm gonna definitely read the the full article because I'm I'm interested now to see exactly what happened there. And you know, obviously, uh, you know. <laughs> think about mental health. I was just right. I mean, these school shootings are, are redi- kind of crazy. Ridiculous. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it's this, it's this nuts, this crazy world where, and that's a mental health thing, right? I mean, that's, there's a lot to that, but part of that's a mental health. So it's a struggle that we have probably more than any other country in the world. So, um, you know, we've got a lot of work to do there and, you know, um, I guess, we won't dig in too deep and, you know, more to that, but just to say that, um, you know, I'll leave a, a link there. And, and if anybody has questions, they can connect with you. Is that something that they can, um, you know, if they had any other questions or wanted to go deeper on it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Had, had lots of, lots of people talk to me about that over the years and, and, uh, um, you know, I've, I've got nothing to hide with it. Um, and, uh, so certainly, certainly happy to answer questions about that too. Although I would prefer to talk about lake fishing. Yeah. Yeah. No, we'll, we'll start, yeah. we'll start with the lake fishing for sure. Um, okay. Well, I'll, uh, just a couple more here and we'll, and we'll get out here. What, um, so beads, uh, it sounds like beads versus no beads. Do you even use beads anymore on, on flies? I use a lot of I use a lot of beads um, for stuff that I'm going to fish underneath an indicator, um, and not much if I'm going to be stripping uh, stripping the fly on a sinking line um, and or wind drifting the fly. But um, you know, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say never ever for either one. You know, I mean, some sometimes under an indicator I use flies with no beads, and sometimes. Uh, use beads on on flies with a sinking line or or flies that I'm wind drifting. So, you know, I don't think there's like a, necessarily a set rule. Um, 
Okay. Uh, for me, as much as as much as it is, is how, how do I want that fly to perform in the water? You know, at what depth, um, what kind of movement? Um, you know, I think for calabatus nymphs, if I'm stripping a calabatus nymph in the, in the margins of the lake um, on a midge tip or a hover line, um, I think a, a fly with no bead makes a heck of a lot more sense than a fly with a bead. Um, but you know, uh, if I'm if I'm wind drifting a mm-hmm. fly starting out in 20 feet of water. Um, that calabatus nymph sure as heck could have a bead because uh, it may, you know, may get down a little bit better. And if I'm, if I'm lock style fishing it, um, it, it could actually have kind of a jigging effect as I'm, as I'm moving that line back towards the boat. So yeah, um, okay. it just depends. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's good. Gotcha. Good to have both. Okay. And, um, and the, the, the 222, which is top two flies, tips and resources. Do you have, um, you know, I guess, and if we're, we're talking, we've talked a lot about different uh, techniques and kind of the etymology piece. Are there two flies that you would pick out? Let's, let's go just take it to dry. So, you know, you're like you said, you start out early in the morning on East Lake. Uh, maybe, yeah. you, maybe you already mentioned this, but are there two dry flies that are kind of your go-to dries? If you were, if you were to say, all right, what are your top two dry flies for for the lakes that I fish the most? Mm-hmm. I would have to. I would probably say. My my favorite dry fly. I mean the the one that's bread and butter for me that I catch a lot of fish with um, throughout a, throughout any week of the season would probably be a black beetle. Um, about cool. a size, you know, twelve, fourteen, or sixteen. Probably focusing most on a on a fourteen um, black foam beetle. Um, uh-huh. And then mm, maybe maybe a purple haze. Um, it, it, as crazy as that sounds. Um, I, throughout a lot of calabatus hatches, I've done really, really quite well fishing purple haze. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, there, there are times that, yeah, you got to go to a, you know, a last chance cripple with the, you know, um, hair up pattern with the CDC wing and buy up body and, and all that are uh, almost done, you know, but, um, yeah, I would say probably a, a purple haze and a and a black foam beetle. Okay, and how about um, you know tips? You know if and and let's just talk if if you want to focus on dry fly. Any tips that come up to mind that might help somebody? They're you know out in the lake on a boat trying to catch a fish on a dry. Is, is there anything that comes to mind? Yeah, I, you know I was hoping that you would ask me that because there as a guide, you know I get to see people of a lot of different abilities. Um, I get some really, really talented fishermen and a lot of people that are definitely more kind of upper beginner. I mean, I, I've had people this year that have been total beginners, had wow. to teach them how to cast in the boat. And that's, that's not, I, I'm not really my favorite. No. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, to, to go on a lake, especially kind of mid season like this, you know, kind of the harder time of the year, you know, if you if you can if you can make a good presentation at you know forty or fifty feet, um, you're you know with a dry fly, you're going to catch probably quite a few more fish than you can if you can only get it out there at twenty or twenty five feet. Um, and so, I really wish that you know, really wish that people um, would kind of come to it with a little bit more seriousness in in mm-hmm. terms of learning how to cast. Um, and, and even some of my my better casters, um, you know, people that that know casting don't necessarily understand, you know, like angles. Um, you know, if you're fishing a 20 foot long leader with two nymphs and maybe a small split shot and and uh, and a big strike indicator, it's it's really wobbly. You know, it's it's like mm-hmm. a, it's a non tapered leader. It's it's really wobbly to cast. And you know, if you're if you're trying to lift that thing up out of the water. Um, it, you know, you, you have to kind of know when and where to do that. And, and, you know, so many people try to strip it in a little bit or don't strip it in at all. And they try to lift all that out of the water and, and it just comes crashing into the boat yeah. or wraps around their rod tip and, yeah. and just kind of understanding, you know, that, that sort of, ang- you know, it's called angling for a reason. It's about, it's about angles and, and there's mm-hmm. such a, a blend of art and science and the casting and, and, um, and physics obviously play a huge role in it, but so does geometry. And and uh, and just in terms of you know kind of knowing how to change direction with the cast, um, you know, and 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 picking up uh, flies out of the water that may be down deep, and and realizing that the roll cast is a giant friend not only as it 
is it a presentation cast, but a preparation mm-hmm. cast to, to be able to roll cast those flies up to the surface and, and get them, you know, in a straight line and in front of the rod tip so that when you do lift them out of the water, they come over the, over the rod tip in a straight line and, yeah. and they're able to be re-delivered. It's huge. Right. It's huge. And there's just so, so many customers that are in the I boat that, that I watch. Skill. That don't understand it. They, how, it's, yeah, they just don't understand it at all. How do you, when you have a 20 foot leader and, um, you know, it's down there on the bottom with an indicator. So, yeah. you know, picking it up, you strip it in, you pick it up, you maybe do a roll cast to get it on the surface. You know, and yeah, then when sometimes you come, it takes three or four roll casts. Yeah, three or four, yeah, to, to yeah. get it up. So you yeah. eventually get it up. Now you go back with your back cast. Are you typically coming out and doing one back cast and then shooting it out to the spot, or, or do you do you recommend maybe? Are you doing you know with, false casts? No, not not much yeah. false casting with it with something like that. Yeah, I mean, just you shoot know, it out. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm a pretty decent caster, um, but uh, but um, I I would say I do very little false casting with that. I kind of do you know roll cast. It might take three or four roll casts to get those nymphs up to the surface and to plop out in front of the indicator so that everything's in a straight line for the for the lift back of the of the initial back cast, and then and then I'll. I'll roll that thing, you know, forward with a with a overhand cast and plop it down on the water, let it water load for just a moment, and then pick it up one more time with a little bit of a shoot and and try to throw it out to the distance that I need to get. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, when you're when you're chronomet fishing, you know, 18 feet deep, it doesn't really have to be too far away from the boat. Oh, right. I mean, a, yep. You know, like a 20 to 20 foot 30 cast foot cast is, is, is fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's your whole leader. So you're basically you got about 10 feet of line out, and then your leader, or you know, is that or are you? Ca- well, no, you're you're casting a 20 30 foot leader. Then you have your fly that drops down another 20 feet. Yeah, so no, I'm fi- I'm fishing with about a 20 foot leader in in total length and adjusting the indicator on the butt oh, yeah. section of the leader for to for depth. At. So yeah. so the fl- the the fly line is you know 20, 30, maybe 40 feet of fly line being cast. Gotcha. How, how do you know right? when you get down to the um the the correct depth? I use a fish finder. Um, you know, I've got a really nice fish okay. finder on the boat. Um, so I know what my depth there you is, go. but. For those that don't have a fish finder, you know, you can, what, what, what I think is really cool is you can get a, um, like a little, um, you know, quarter ounce lead weight. Um, and what, what I've done is, um, I actually get some 80 pound mono, uh, with like a little, um, metal clip and I, and I take that, um, take that clip and attach it to that weight. Um, and then I singe the end of the mono so that, so that they, um, are, are connected permanently and then and then you can actually clip that little that little metal clip to the fly and drop it down to the bottom and then set your indicator off of off of that oh, wow. weight and then and then pull that up it's it's real i can send you a photo of it and okay. show you how how that works but it's yeah it's really really uh easy to do it gets down to uh um depth super mm-hmm. fast so you can set your indicator you know really really quickly awesome cool. actually yeah so it's, you know a lot of guys are going to be out in pontoon boats or float yep. tubes that are going to be listening to this that that maybe want to do some really effective chronomed fishing mm-hmm. they're not going to have that that super nice you know hummingbird uh, depth finder on the no. on their boat no. um so to you know and it, and it makes a difference you know you, a lot of times people guess um and their flies are either too deep and getting down in the yep. weeds or or their flies are way too shallow yeah. um and uh and so they're just not getting down and i i think with with balance leeches um it it makes a huge difference on on getting out to the right depth and and of course with chronomids it's it's even more important yeah okay good now that uh and then as far as uh resources you mentioned a couple with the um bugs of the underworld um are there any other uh, resources you might note here for uh, I guess we were talking East Lake and and you know dry flies or chronomids. Anything else come to mind that we want to note here? Well, um, yeah, we talked about um, any anything from Rally and Chan their oh, yeah. their uh, their app. Is Rally? Um, do you think? I mean, Rally. So when we talk about stillwaters, because Rally, you know, I mean, actually, when you look at it, Rickards has been around probably doing it longer, but Rally seems to be the big name. Who else is out there in the stillwater game that you would say is is a big a big name or somebody to follow? Mm, well, I think Rally and Chan are, are, Those are, are the guys. My, my style of my style yep. of fishing, the guys that I'm going to trust the most. Um, I think, um, you know, um, that just just their just their philosophy and their style um, really mm-hmm. 
totally jives with what what I find myself on the water. Um, and so, you know, I'm I'm certainly willing to experiment with a lot of a lot of things. But um, it, you know, if I want to catch fish, um, I'm basically doing it in the same way that those guys are doing it. Gotcha. So okay. that that's uh, that's that's my opinion. Yeah. Um, I have not you know had the success of you know the the other guy's style. Um, and, and there, there's some, there's some books out there, uh, that I've recently read on still water fishing that I'm like, are you kidding me? Oh, really? I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> no so, kidding. W- without calling anybody out, yeah, I, yeah. I would be like, yeah, that's, that's not, I don't think that's really true. That, that is crazy. Thing. I mean, I could see a, um, you know, a blog post out there where it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's not good. But man, a, a whole book, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. a lot of time yeah. to put into something to not be accurate with your, um, your info. Yeah, I was really excited about one one of the books that came out. Um, you know, fairly well known fly tire guy and and uh, um, friend of mine recommended it. He got the book, and I was like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll order one. I'll order some for the shop. And I I, I picked it up, and I was like, Ugh, man, I don't think I'll I don't think I'll restock this. And I I, I didn't even really think that I needed to like totally finish the book. I just yeah, yep. didn't. There you go. No, there you go. Okay. Didn't work. All right. Well, I think we've hit on enough here to cover, you know, as far as the resources, uh, there's, you know, plenty of uh, stuff out there just from, from Phil, you know, and, and that crew, but, um, you know, for yourself, anything new, um, you want to note, uh, coming up in the next six to 12 months that, um, you know, either yourself or personally that, that you have coming. Well, you know, I'm, I'm continue to have uh, a good guide season coming up here. We've got, um, still a, you know, a, a good couple of months ahead of me. And then after that, uh, that's kind of a lot of winter travel um, that that uh, oh, Tina yeah. and I uh, do kind of every do you year. Do, you know, we, do you do kind of the show type of circuit? No, thing? no, no, not at all. Actually, yeah. um, we 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 just go we just go places. Like I've been I've been down to Patagonia seventeen oh, sure. times and yep. been to New Zealand a few times. But you know, we go to Belize almost every year. Um, so this year we're going to try something new. We're going to Cuba in November. Oh, there you go. And we're going to go uh, Dorado fishing in Argentina in February and, and then back to Belize in May. And then um, got a couple of my boys from the shop that are going to lead the, the uh, Chile trip this year instead of us. So um, we're looking forward to, to a few new things and, and taking a year off from Patagonia and, and trying some new stuff. So that's that's kind of where we're at for the for the winter and then when we get back from our last trip uh next spring in belize it'll be it'll be time to put the lake boat on the water again so over the between now and then i'll tie a lot of flies and and sit at the fly tying desk and and dream of lakes uh in the yeah. during the summer season and, and wish that I was there. That's awesome. All right. All right, Jeff. That's uh, No, I appreciate uh, you coming on and sharing. Uh, if they want to find you, then go to the flyfishersplace.com if they have any questions. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Would love to hear from anybody that, that thought the show was cool. And, and uh, you know, um, if anybody wants to go on a guide trip with us, um, I, would, I would love to hear from you. Great. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there'll be some interest there, especially since... Uh, you know, you, you clarify, definitely. I, I love the mixing things up. I think, you know, getting focused kind of gets a little boring. So I think your style is going to work. But, um, okay, well, until until we connect, um, I'll, I'll let you get out it, uh, get at it and uh, talk to you soon. Okay, Dave. Thanks right. so much. All right. See ya. Yep. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links we covered, just go to webflyswing.com slash 103. I've added some local trips um, that include Steelhead and Stillwater. Find one, two, three-day trips and more with local guides uh, from the show. Go to wetflyswing.com slash destination to find out more and get details on the upcoming trip. That will also be uh, in the show notes, the link right at the top. Thanks again for stopping by. Check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to maybe see you on the river or online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.